All right, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. This is Dr. Ephraim. Today's date is December 18th, 2022. And if you're listening to the sound of my voice, that means you were blessed to see another day. And for that, all praise, honor, and glory is due to the Most High God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, for now and forever. All right, welcome, everyone. All my new subscribers and older like, if you haven't already, make sure you hit that subscribe button, hit the notification bell, and select all. So that way you'll be notified every time I upload a new presentation. All right, today what I wanted to bring forth is um, I saw a um, documentary that inspired this particular lesson right here. And the documentary was concerning the um, the last uh, uh, American slave ship um, called the uh, Clotilda, right? And I'm going to be honest with you, this was this was definitely you know news to me because I had never heard of the story, never heard of no, the, the Clotilda or nothing like that. So let me just start by saying that. And um, basically with the, with the story of the Clotilda, what makes it so um, such a big deal, I guess, is that it was um, basically it was illegal because by the time the Clotilda came and dropped off um, my brothers and sisters out there in, in Alabama, um, slavery had already been abolished. So basically, it started off as some kind of sick bet that um, that they could um, still do it, even though it was against the law. And um, supposedly that uh, if you were caught, you know, transporting or, you know, engaging in, in illegal slave activity, you could be, you know, put to death. So anyway, they they, they, they did that and they call themselves trying to, you know, blow up the, uh, the Gotilda to hide the evidence of the crime. Because basically it was a crime, what they did. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it's just a lot involved with it, man. I definitely would recommend, um, you know, watching the, um, the documentary, you know, and I was like most of the brothers and sisters I've seen in that documentary. I wasn't, I didn't, I felt no sense of pride or, or nothing. I mean, if anything, I felt tinges of anger and just disdain, just knowing what I know. I could see it on their faces too. They wouldn't, I mean, it's bitter, bitter sweet. And I say sweet, you know, you know cautiously you know i could tell it was kind of bittersweet most of the um i think two to three uh african tribes that the that they came from those 100 i think 110 people that was on the Clo clotilda came from yoruba so nine times out of ten they were they were most likely that ephraimites just like me because i'm yoruba slash ephraimites and I, i'm sure the majority of them don't know that that they're really israelites but hopefully this this lesson will get over to somebody from there and, and let them know who they really are um, so yeah, I think <clears throat> they're, um, they were Yoruba and Iwe, and I think, uh, I forget the third tribe, but, but if I'm not mistaken, I remember thinking, okay, so they're a mixture of Ephraimites and Judah. So basically the, those members that was on the Clotilda was a mix between Ephraim and Judah, Ephraimites and Judahites, right? So anyway, um, I don't know, uh, Kudjo, this Mr. Kudjo Lewis, he's like the main focus. He's like one of the last survivors that literally came off that boat literally and um he's he's given a lot of props he even has like a bust of his of his um his likeness this and that i'm not really sure why but um there there are two other um survivors um that aren't even identified or mentioned and so um no disrespect to 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 you know mr kudjo uh, lewis and his ancestors but i felt like those other two needed to be identified as well and, and let's give them a little shine and, and um you know give them some Give them a life. Give them, you know, get their their uh, their lives a, a a a spotlight, if you will. So that's what inspired this lesson. So anyway, this is about the last the last American slave ship, the Clotilde, and the last three um, surviving members. Let's get it. All right, and the cited source and reference for this article I'm reading from um, is from National Geographic, Mr. Joel Joel K. Bourne Jr. Um, this article was published uh, May 22nd, 2019. All right. All right. It says the Schooner Clotilda, the last known ship to bring enslaved Africans to America's shores, has been discovered in a remote arm of Alabama's Mobile River or Mobile River following an intensive years long year long search by marine archaeologists. Quote, descendants of the Clotilla survivors have dreamed of this discovery for generations End quote, says uh, Lisa Demetropolis Jones, executive director of the Alabama Historical Commission, or AHC for short, and the state historic preservation officer. Quote, we're thrilled to announce that their dream has finally come true. End quote. Don't know why that would be anyone's dream, but OK, uh, we'll roll with that for now. Um, it says um, here's a, 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 the, the caption under the, the picture of the sh uh, the uh, the ship. It says one hundred and nine 
African quote unquote captive survived the brutal six week passage from West Africa to Alabama in Clotilda's cramped hold, originally built to transport cargo, not people. The schooner was unique in design and dimensions, a fact that helped archaeologists uh, identify the wreck. All right. It says the captives who arrived aboard Clotilda were the last of an estimated 389,000 Africans delivered into bondage in mainland America from the early 1600s to 1860s. That number is grossly uh lower low it isn't no man no anyway let me let me just this is what he said so let me let me let me just read the article this is what this person said thousands of vessels were involved in the transatlantic trade but very few slave wrecks have ever been found the discovery of the clotilda shed new light on a lost chapter of american history says frederick hybert archaeologist in residence at the national geographic society which supported the search this finding is also a critical piece of the story of Africa Town, which was built by the resilient descendants of America's last slave ship. Rare first hand accounts left by the slaveholders as well as their victims offer a one of a kind window into the Atlantic slave trade, says Sylvian Dioff, a noted historian of the African diaspora. Quote, it's the best documented story of a slave voyage in the Western Hemisphere, says Dioff whose 2007 book Dreams of Africa and Alabama chronicles the Clotilda's saga. Quote, the captives were sketched, interviewed, even filmed, she says, referring to some who lived into the 20th century. The person who organized the trip talked about it. The captain of the ship wrote about it. So we have, we have the story from several perspectives. I haven't seen anything of that sort anywhere else. Uh, in 1927, Kajo Lewis, then one of the last living Clotilda survivors, shared his life story with anthropologist Zora Neale Hurston. Her book, Barracoon, finally published in 2018, includes Lewis's telling of the harrowing voyage aboard the Clotilda. They say it began with a bet. The Clotilda story began when Timothy Mayer, a wealthy mobile land, mobile, or mobile, mobile, as I've heard it's pronounced as well, landowner and shipbuilder allegedly wagered several northern businessmen a thousand dollars that he could smuggle a cargo a cargo of Africans into Mobile Bay under the nose of federal officials. Importing slaves into the United States had been illegal since 1808, and southern plantation owners had been uh, had seen prices in the domestic slave trade skyrocket. Many, including Mayor. We're advocating for reopening the trade. <laughs> yeah. Mayor charted a sleek, swift schooner named Clotilda and enlisted its builder, Captain William Foster, to sail it to the notorious slave port of Uweda, Uweda, Uweda in present day Benin to buy captives. Foster left West Africa with 110 young men, women, and children crowded into the schooner's hold. One girl reportedly died during the brutal six-week voyage, purchased for $9,000 in gold. The human cargo was worth more than 20 times that amount in 1860, Alabama. After transferring the captives to a riverboat owned by Mayor's brother, Foster bur burned the slaver to the waterline to hide their crime. Clotilda kept her secrets uh, over the decades, even as some deniers contended that the shameful episode never occur occurred. After the Civil War ended and slavery was abolished, the Africans longed to return to their home in West Africa. Lacking the means, they managed to buy small plots of land north of Mobile, where they uh, formed their own tight-knit community that came to be known as Africa Town, where they made uh, new lives for themselves but never lost their African identity. Many of their descendants still live there today and grew up with stories of the famous ship that brought their ancestors to Alabama. If they find evidence of that ship, it's going to be big, descendant Lorna Woods predicted earlier this year. All Mama told us would be validated. It would do us a world of good. Mary Elliott, a, a, Mary Elliott, a curator of the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture, agrees, quote, There are many examples today. The Tulsa race riots of 1921, this story, even the Holocaust, where some people say it never happened. Now, because of the archaeology, the arch uh, archival 
or archival, I'm sorry, research that science combined with the collective memories of the community, it can't be refuted. They are now connected to their ancestors in a tangible way. Knowing this story is true. Their ancestors survived slavery. Can their descendants say, save the town they built? Uh, end quote. And let's see, several attempts to locate uh, Clotilda's remains have been made over the years, but the Mobile Tensaw Delta is rife with sloths, oxbows, and bayous, as well as scores of shipwrecks for more than three centuries of maritime activity. Okay, so I'm going to move away from the, the actual Clotilda, and I'm going to move to the three last survivors. Um, but that's pretty much the um, the backdrop for, for this ship, which they, they consider uh, the last American slave ship. Now, you know, they, they, I, I saw in the documentary, they even have like a a, a day of, of recognizing this or some, some kind of way or whatever. It's going to be a big tourist attraction. But but most of our people on that on that documentary was talking about, OK, yeah, that's cool. We got the Tilda, but what's up with the reparations, though? So now we have proof that a crime com was committed. See what I'm saying? So, so them finding the proof, yeah, it's a part of history, but it's a part of history that's just going to prove more and more that, you know, we, we you know, we deserve some reparations. And to be honest with you, that's that's only that's only that story. And yeah, the Clotilda was 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 was, was you know, getting more light because, you know, it was it was illegal at that time. But it doesn't take away from the fact that all those illegal slaves that were brought over, they were they were they were, you know, um, brought over here before the Clotilda. You know, say my ancestors, you know, your ancestors. You understand what I'm saying? Like, no, we can't let the reparations stop there. I mean, yeah, that's an intriguing story, no doubt. But I watched that documentary just like the majority of them that was actually there. There was no joy in that. And then, and then one of the ancestors of the, of, of the forest, forest foster dude will try to say that the slaves were treated well, or like our, our, our dude was a good master. And one of the brothers shut that down. He's like, man, check this out, man. You know, good master, bad master. He's all a master. We, you know, our people wasn't slaves. Like, the hell are you talking about? But anyway, let's, let's get on to the next segment, man. Then I find these last uh, living survivors of the transatlantic slave trade. Yeah, okay. Um, but like I said in the previous uh, segment, uh, Mr. Kajo Lewis is one of three uh, survivors um, from the Clotilda. Uh, I'm, you know, I'm going to identify the other two, but uh, we're going to start with him since he's the one that they kind of com commemorate and um, they made a bust of him and, and everything like that. So let's go into uh, Mr. Kajo Lewis's uh, biography. He says he was born sometime in 1841 and he died July 17th, 1935, born Alalu Alu Ale Kusala, um, and also known as Kajo Lewis, was the third to last adult survivor of the transatlantic slave trade between Africa and the United States. Together with 115 other African captives, he was brought to the United States on board the ship Clotilda in 1860. Wow, just to say that. So, uh, the captives were landed in back war on backwaters of the Mobile River near Mobile, Alabama. Uh, and hidden from authorities, the ship was scuffled or scuttled to evade discovery and remained undiscovered until January 2018. After the Civil War and Emancipation, Lewis and other members of the Clotilda group became free. A number of them founded a community at Magazine Point, north of Mobile, Mobile Alabama. They were joined there by others born in Africa. Now designated as the Africatown Historic District, the community was added to the National Register of historic places in 2012. In old age, Kosala um, uh, was that preserved the experiences of the Clotilda captives by providing accounts of the history of the group to visitors, including Mobile artist and um, author author Emma Langdon Roche 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 and author and um, folklorist Zora Neil Hurston. He lived to 1935 and was long thought to be the last survivor of the Clotilda until historian Hannah Durkin identified two longer-lived Clotilda survivors who made the voyage as children. And that's Miss Radoshi, who died in 1937, and Miss Matilda McCreer, who died in 1940. All right, they say he was born, uh, Mr. Uh, Kudjo was born uh, as Kosala or Aluale Kosala. Americans would later transcribe his given name as Kazula around 1841 in West Africa. Analyzing names and the other words attributed to the Africa town founders, historian Sovian Dioff has concluded that he and most other members of the African town community belong to the Yoruba people. Huh? That's my people. And most of and a lot of yours as well. Uh, E1B1A7A Israelites all day, man. All day. Um, belongs to the Yoruba people from the Bonte uh, region of Benin. 
Lewis's father was uh, Aluale and his mother Fandula. He had five full siblings and 12 half siblings through his father and other two wives. Interviewers Emma Langdon Roche and Zora Neil, Neil Hurston and those who used their work referred to Lewis and his fellow captives as Takars based on his account. Dioff believes that the term Takar might have some, might have come from a misunderstanding of the name uh, of their local king or the name of their village. In April or May of 1860, his village was attacked and Lewis was taken prisoner by female warriors led by the king Glil of Dahomey. Mm. You mean to tell me they were actually uh, um they did a they just did a movie on the so called um female uh warriors and 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 the brothers and sisters that was on the Clotilda were a result of the female warriors capturing them from the homie now that's some kind of messed up by irony right there that's that's a trip that just that just hit me wow um so it says yeah they were taken prisoners by female warriors um led by the king of Dahomey. that's that has to be them during an annual dry season raid for slaves, along with other captives, he was taken to the slaving port of Wida or Wida or Yuda, could be Judah for Yuda, right? And sold to the Captain William Foster of the Clotilda, an American ship recently built in Mobile, Alabama, and owned by businessman Timothy Mayer. The importation of slaves into the United States had been illegal since 1808, but slaves were still routinely smuggled in from Spanish Cuba. Some reports allege that Mayor fully intended to break the law and that he had set he had bet a businessman one hundred thousand dollars that he could successfully evade the prohibition of the transatlantic slave trade. In a similar situation, the owners of Wanderer, which had illegally brought enslaved people to Georgia in eighteen fifty eight, were indicted and tried for piracy in a US federal court in Savannah in May of nineteen sixty, but were acquitted by the jury. Yeah, of course they were. It's a bunch of bunch of mess is what it is, man. By the time the Clotilda reached the Mississippi coast in July of 1860, the United States federal government had been alerted to its activities, and Timothy Mayer, his brother Burns, and his other associate, John Dabney, were arrested and charged with illegal possession of the captives. However, there was a gap, a gap of almost five months between the end of uh, end of July 1860 when summonses and writs of seizure were issued against the mayors and Dabney in mid-December when they received them. During the uh, intervening period, the captives were dispersed and hidden, and without their physical presence as evidence, the case was dismissed in January. Kangaroo court at its finest. <laughs> That's man. Oh, my God. Anyway, it says, during the mid-1860s, uh, Mr. Lewis established a common law relationship with another Clotilda survivor, um, Abiel, Abiel, or Cecilia. They formally married on March 15th, along with several other couples from Africa Town. They remained together until Abiel's death in 1905. They had six children, five sons and a daughter, for each whom they gave uh, both an African name with an, Af with an American name. Their eldest son, Alec, or Alec, uh, Laijimi, um, which translated from Yoruba, meaning I suffered, became a grocer. He took his wife to live in a house on his father's land. Diof describes his arrangement as a Yoruba-style family compound. Another son, K K Kajo Frushtan, was fatally shot by a black sheriff's deputy in 1902. Luz outlived his wife and all of his children. Wow. He allowed his daughter-in-law, Mary Woodlew, was his grandchildren and eventually her second husband, Joe Lou was no relation to remain in their house in the compound. Um, and it says in the first quarter of the 20th century, Lewis began to serve as an informant for scholars and other writers, sharing the history of the Clotilde Africans and traditional stories and tales. All right, so that's Mr. Cudjo Lewis. All right, this elder right here is Miss Fredoshi, also known as Sally Smith. Um, it says uh, her story is that like many African people forced into uh, American slavery, Radoshi was only a child when slave traders chained her to their boat. Born in 1848 and kidnapped at age 12 in what is now Benin, she became a prisoner on the Clotilda, uh, the last known slave ship to smuggle people into the United States. Um, uh, let's see here. Uh, 
Before scholar Hannah Durkin of Newcastle University identified Radoshi, the last known survivor of the Clotilda was Alawale Kasala or Kajo. Uh, Lou was a man captured at age 19 in West Africa who lived until 1935. As Kajo Lou was both he and Radoshi were among uh, the more than 100 African children, teenagers, and young adults who arrived in Alabama on the illegal slave ship in 1860, one year before the Civil War. Slave traders forced the 12 year old Radoshi to be the quote unquote wife wow, of an adult enslaved man who spoke a different language which was very common in Africa back back then, very common. Um, the, tra the traders then sold Radoshi and the man as a couple to Washington Smith, founder of Alabama's Bank of Selma. Later, Radoshi described this forced child marriage to the civil rights activist Amelia Bonton Robinson. Quote, I was 12 years old and he was a man from another tribe who had a family in Africa, Radoshi is quoted as saying in Bonton Robinson's memoir, Bridge Across Jordan. Quote, I couldn't understand his talk and he couldn't understand me. They put us on block together and sold us for a man uh, and wife, end quote. For nearly five years, Radoshi worked in the house and the fields of Smith's Bowl Cheeto Plantation in Dallas County. Smith also forced her to take a new name, quote, end quote, Sally Smith. Radoshi conceived and gave birth to her daughter on the plantation. When emancipation came to all states in June 19, 1965, a.k.a. Juneteenth, Radoshi was only about 17 years old. With few options and no means to travel back home to her family in West Africa, she continued to live on the Bold Chiteau Plantation with her daughter. She and other enslaved people later came to own around 6,000 acres of land on the plantation, where she spent the rest of her life. Durkin found evidence of Radoshi's life in an incredible variety of sources, Boynton Robinson's memoir, Zora Neale Hurston's unpublished writings, and even a film. That film containing footage of Radoshi is the only known footage of a female survivor of the transatlantic slave trade. My God, my God. Durkin published her research of, on Radoshi in the 2019 volume of Slavery and Abolition. The only other documents we have of African women's experiences of the transatlantic slavery uh, are fleeting allusions that were typically recorded by slave owners, so it is incredible to be able to tell Radoshi's life story, Durkin said in a Newcastle press release. Rarely do we get to hear the story of an individual woman, let alone see what she looked like, how she dressed, and where she lived. Sylvian D. A. Dioff, a visiting professor at Brown University Center for the Study of Slavery and Justice, says that Radoshi's story is valuable in and of itself, but cautious that we shouldn't be overly focused on which survivor was the quote last one. Man, you don't. You know what? Let me let me just quote. There were lots of very young people on the Clotilda, and some may have died even later than she. Yeah, but do you have evidence of that? Why would you even make the statement unless you had some kind of evidence of that? Why would you make that statement, though? What does it matter if it was? Do we have any evidence that someone lived longer than her or lived longer than the, you know what I mean? Like, it's just, it's like, just, uh. Anyways, man, that's, that's Miss Radoshi, also known as uh, Sally Smith, one of the last survivors of the transatlantic slave trade. Like, she was literally on that ship. On to the next segment. And this elder right here, my brothers and sisters and fellow and sister Israelites and sojourners, is Mrs. Matilda McCrear. She is credited as credited as being the last known surviving member of the transatlantic slave trade on board the Clotilda. And she was a Ruba. She was an Ephraimite. And I and I dare say she died without knowing who she truly was. She was in, she was from the tribe of Ephraim. May the Most High have mercy on her eternal soul, all of them. But this is her story. Uh, Miss Matilda McCrear, born sometime in 1857, died January 1940, was the last known living survivor of the, uh, the transatlantic slave trade on the ship Clotilda. She was a, a Yoruba who was captured and brought to Mobile, uh, Alabama at the age of two with her mother and older sister. The girls were sold away from their mother and never reunited. The curses, man, the curses. Yo, you will be separated from your children. Your, your eyes will long for them, but they will go into, oh my God. My, 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 uh, my Clotilda ancestor, uh, ancestors, um, my brothers and sisters from Mobile, 
Um, we're all related. Y'all all know what time it is, man. We are the results of the curses of the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 28. The, the Bible tells talks of this. We, 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 lived, we lived that. Our ancestors lived through that, going back to slavery on ships, the yokes of iron on our neck, the whole nine. I really hope some of you find this channel so you can tell your people who you really are. But anyway, he said the girls, they, they were never reunited with their mom. Together with other American slaves, a Union-occupied territory in the South, Matilda was granted freedom by the Emancipation Proclamation of 1863. She and her family did not achieve freedom until after the de facto abolition of slavery in 1865. She continued to be a sharecropper as an adult and had a family of 14 children with a white German-born American common-law husband. Wow. She died in Selma, Alabama. McCrary's life became publicly known through research by Hannah Durkin of Newcastle University, published in 2020. McCrary was captured as a young child in West Africa with her mother and sister by the army of the West African Kingdom of Dahomey, which had attacked their home. The, the, so, so let me find out. So, so, so basically, these, these, these so-called uh, women warriors were, were raiding villages looking for slaves, for were people to enslave? That's crazy. That, that's crazy. Uh, the Dahomeans transported their prisoners to the coastal port of, of Utah. Uh, Captain William Foster of the Clotilda, the last known slave ship to have carried captives from Africa to the United States, later arrived in Utah and uh, transported 110 enslaved Africans, including McCrear, to the United States illegally because the U.S. illegalized the transatlantic slave trade in 1808 with the act prohibiting importation of slaves. Writing in his journal, 1860, Captain William Foster of the Clotilda described how he came in possession of the enslaved Africans on his ship. Quote, from thence I went to see the king of Dahomey. Having agreeably transacted affairs with the prince, we went to the warehouse where they had uh, in confinement 4,000 captives in a state of nudity from which they gave me liberty to select 125 as mine, offering to brand them for me which I preemptorily pre forbid, that's not even a word, but anyway, commenced taking on cargo of Negroes, uh, of Negroes, uh, successfully securing on board 110. She was a member of the Yoruba people. So she was a Ephraimite that had all these seeds, man, would eat them. Some German born white American. Wow. Um, so she died not knowing she was an Ephraimite. She received traditional facial scars, which were visible to the rest for the rest of her life. When she was two years old, she and her mother, Gracie, and sister Sally, as they were named in the U.S., were captured and bought by planner, memorable Krieg. They were among more than 100 Africans transported in 1860 on the Clotilda. She had two other sisters whose names are not known and a stepfather guy. The girls were later sold apart from their mother and never reunited. Mm. After the abolition of slavery in 1865, McCrear, who first took the surname Craig, continued to work as a sharecropper in Alabama with her mother and sister. She never married, but according to her grandson, had 14 children with a white German-born man. She changed her name from Craig to McCrear. In her 70s, she made a legal claim for compensation for her enslavement, which was dismissed. According to Dirk, and she appears to have continued to have worn her hair in a traditional Yoruba style all of her life. She died in Selma, Dallas County, Alabama, aged 83. Prior to the publication of Durkin's research in 2020, McCrear's temporary, contemporary, Robert Doshi, was thought to be the last living survivor of the flotilla of the transatlantic slave trade. And that, my brothers and sisters, is the identity and the life of all three of the last known survivors that were actually on the on the slave ship, the Clotilda. And I just felt it was important to recognize all three of them. You know, no disrespect to them, to cut Joe Lewis, but I don't know why the focus was put on him so much. They didn't even think to identify the the two um, elderly women, you know, the two women that were they were on that ship, and they were on the ship as guest guest kids. Could you imagine being young on a on a ship like that, on a on a voyage like that, being so young? But either way, man, um, y'all definitely check out the um the um documentary. It's on um Netflix. The name of the documentary is Descendant. 
So shout out, you know, peace and blessings to all my um my peoples out there, our peoples out there in, in, in Mobile. And, um, you know, I hope they do right by y'all. I mean, because they sure haven't been doing right by us as a whole collectively. We all from the same seed, even though y'all's story is a little more intriguing because it was quote unquote illegal. But it didn't, there wasn't nobody really held accountable for it. They didn't really care, man. You know, it's, it's talking about all this illegal stuff. But see, now, knowing that they have proof that a crime was committed, we have more of a, we have more of the law to stand on now on our side. So maybe something happened for them and maybe it'll trickle down something happened for all of us collectively who were descendants of the transatlantic slave trade, i.e. Negroes, i.e. the children of Israel. All right, man. Hope you enjoyed the um the let this lesson. Um, like I said, I was inspired to do it by the documentary, and um, I did exactly what I wanted to do. I identified all three of the surviving members of the Clotilda. All right, the last, the quote unquote last American slave ship. So until next time, man. Stop even signing off, man. Saying Shalawami, elect.